So once we know where the qualitative methods, the family of methods that suit our research project, that they can get the sort of data we need to answer the questions we want to ask, the next stage is how do we approach gathering our data? In other words, how do we position ourselves as students, researchers and scholars in relation to the world we are studying? Do we position ourselves, for example, outside of the world we're studying, like an anthropologist might, travelling to a faraway exotic tribe for the first time? Or do we position ourselves inside it, as part of it, studying our local community group or even our local school or college? Each situation makes us think of our own positionality, in other words, our position as a researcher in relation to the field in which we are going to study. This may seem to be a rather abstract or a philosophical question even, but on the contrary, it's a very practical question. It affects our decisions in the field and the success of our methods in practice. So, what are our options? The first option is that we take a detached approach positioning ourselves outside of the world we're going to study. This form of positionality is well summed up by the writer Italo Calvino, who talks of a fictional city where the citizens live in the sky. Calvino describes a city built on stilts, whose citizens live in the sky and gaze at the earth beneath them through their telescopes, never tiring of examining it leaf by leaf and stone by stone, ant by ant, contemplating with fascination their own absence. This detached approach is therefore similar to the bird's eye view or satellite view we talked about in the first podcast in this series. The alternative position is also summed up by Italo Calvino in the following way. On this occasion, Calvino talks about a city where instead of the inhabitants living detached and above the city itself, actually are so involved in the city they stretch strings from the corner of their houses in different colours to mark the relationship that they have with the people who live there. In this sense, therefore, if we think about ourselves as researchers, we're involved in the world that we're studying. We're involved, we have strings attached to ourselves, connected to the different social groups that we're, that we're working with, that we're asking questions of, that we want to find out about. Therefore, in this sense, we're not detached and abstracted from this world, but we're thoroughly involved in it, so much so that we have these invisible strings connecting us through different social relationships to the world that we're studying. So if we adopt the first positionality outlined, approaching our studies as if we are detached from the world, we do so in order to try and minimise our influence on the world when we're trying to find out about it. We just go out to the world, ask our questions we're interested in, measure or document the results, and come back again. This approach is used by natural scientists who go out on an expedition and measure botanical bar uh, plant growth, for example, or similar to how technicians work in a laboratory, studying the research objects from a distance in their test tube. This detached positionality, often used by natural science, is well articulated by Dr Stephen Harding in this excerpt from his film, Animate Earth. For my doctorate, I had to spend many years studying muntjac deer in their natural woodland habitat. I methodically collected reams of data about their movements, food habits and social behaviour. Day and night, I sucked the numbers out of my woodland study site, much like a machine, recording them in my notebooks for analysis later in the university's computers. I became a detached observer, remote, as if looking down from on high, and I began to live in a world of abstraction, of quantities. As noted already, this approach is adopted by natural science, and it's the same philosophy of knowledge gathering that's used in surveys that we've outlined in the first podcast in this series. So when we use surveys, researchers act like detached scientists. We don't get involved in the world we're studying, we simply visit it and try to extract the necessary data by asking the right questions. From this detachment, we ensure that we don't influence the world through our presence, or we seek to minimise the contamination of the data that we're collecting. The knowledge we produce as a consequence is scientific knowledge, an objective, practical truth. In practice, though, as Fontana and Frey argue, this scientific positionality involves a number of key rules we need to invoke in order to create this knowledge. We can understand these rules of the seven commandments of scientific detachment. 
these involve us never deviating from the standardized explanation of a study. We shall never deviate from the sequence of questions or question wording. We shall never allow another person to interrupt the interview. We won't let that person answer for the respondent or offer his or her opinions on the question. We will never suggest an answer or agree or disagree with an answer. We do not give the respondent any idea of our personal views on the topic of the question or survey. We'll never reinterpret or indeed interpret in any way the meaning of a question and we'll never improvise such as by adding answer practicalities or making word changes. So by following these seven commandments of scientific detachment for survey research, it's assumed that we can minimise the influence we have as researchers on the way individuals may answer the questions. As a consequence, we do our best to minimise any contamination of the data we collect. So if we collect data in this way, it's possible for our results to be compared to other responses, in other cases elsewhere. As we've seen in an earlier podcast, from this method and approach, we can produce objective generalisations across large populations and large geographical areas. However, others would contend that it's very difficult not to influence the world when we're gathering our data. However careful and scientific we may want to be, the very nature of being human means that we'll influence the world through our actions. In fact, some would even argue that by trying not to influence the world through using a particular set of questions or techniques to ask those questions, we are inevitably influencing the world nevertheless. Our involvement in the world makes our influence inevitable. So as Frank Fisher argues, facts and frequencies in the social world are not objective or natural in condition. Rather, they depend on the underlying social assumptions and meanings. What is taken to be an objective fact is in effect influenced by a particular community of inquiries and the theoretical presuppositions to which they subscribe. Thus, knowledge is not objective or natural, but socially constructed through the decisions we make in our social research. As often as not, as Bruno Latour has shown, the reality out there is not an objective truth, but produced by the empirical instruments we use and the positionalities we take in relation to the world. As an illustration of this, think how you may feel, for example, if you're asked to stop in the street and answer a survey. Are you busy that day? Is it bad weather? Are you in a bad mood? Is the question friendly? Do the questions they ask fit and resonate with your experiences? How do these factors influence how you might answer those questions? Do you give, for example, a full and frank answer? Or do you give quick, easy answers in order that you can get on with your day? Even scientific detachment, therefore, creates an artificial interaction between researchers and the world. And this interaction can and does influence the knowledge discovered. As May tells us, as most of our lives are spent interacting with others, it comes as no surprise that our actions and opinions, the knowledge, if you like, is always modified according to the social situation we find ourselves in. So scientific detachment therefore modifies our opinions and actions, even if it doesn't set out to. This is why some scholars argue that even scientific detachment influences study. Those who argue that scientific detachment is possible, therefore, may fundamentally misunderstand the nature of the social. From this perspective, therefore, we're always attached to the world we're studying. It's impossible to live in a metaphorical city on stilts and study the world as if we are absent from it. Our positionality is always an influence. So we must be sensitive to it. How are we going to influence it? And how are we going to be accountable for it? So, what if we say we are attached to the world and we take an attached positionality to the world we study? What happens if we begin from the premise, not that we know reality because we're separate from it, but that we can know that reality because we are connected with it? Many scholars argue that we must take an attached positionality. Indeed, we have no option to do so, as social research is not the exploration of the unmediated world of others out there, but the world between ourselves and those others. As a consequence of this attached positionality, we must acknowledge that not only will our choice of questions influence the answers we get, but how we approach our respondents will also influence what knowledge is produced. Perhaps you can think of some of the ways 
in which how we might approach our respondents might influence the knowledge we get from them. So, so far, we have outlined how positionality is far from an abstract thing, but that it is vitally an vitally important influence on the research process. So when we consider positionality seriously, we learn, as Fisher tells us, that what one observes in the social world depends in important ways on where one stands to view it. Given that we always stand connected to the world we're studying, what implications does this have for how we think about the nature of knowledge? From this perspective, no longer is knowledge about scientifically discovered facts gleaned from a distance from the world out there, but rather knowledge is constructed by us and our connections to that world. So most qualitative researchers begin from the premise of being a part of, not apart from, the world they are studying. They assume we are connected to the world and we take into account how this connection influences the knowledge we produce. Knowledge therefore isn't a neutral collection of facts, but the active construction of insight and experience. Knowledge therefore is socially constructed, not absolute. It's temporarily fixed by techniques, convention, society, custom and culture. So as we've seen from podcast one, the need to choose appropriate methods for any research project is vital. When choosing the best methods for your work, it's important to remember this issue about positionality. It's important to remember the illusion of the God trick. As Haraway informs us, the God trick is the fantasy that falls us into thinking we can stand apart from the world and study it, taking a universal and detached position. However, we are not gods. We are thoroughly attached to the worlds we study, and as a consequence, we can only gain a partial and positioned view of it. This is also articulated by Cook and Cran when they note that rather than claiming some sort of Archimedean point from which the world can be critiqued, the researcher's viewpoint is largely a product of social relations both within the academy and between it and the world at large. So when positioning ourselves and our methodological choices, we therefore need to remember that any research encounter does not simply uncover the unmediated world of others, but it is facilitated and limited by our interaction with this world. Our relation with the cultural groups and places we study will significantly affect the type of access, how we can operate our research and the ethics we adopt to implement our methods, and thus the quality of insight we get into their world. So what position are you going to take in relation to your research project? Are you going to be a scientific outsider? And what are the strengths and weaknesses of taking that position? Or on the other hand, are you going to be an interested insider? And what are the pros and cons of taking that position in relation to your research? This Pedagogy Through Podcast series will return with the fourth podcast in the series on conducting interviews.